Okay, so uh, Santa Ana's captured. Uh, he signs a secret treaty with Sam Houston, uh, giving Texas uh, its independence from Mexico, and what he's trying to do is save his life. That's Santa Ana. It was all about Santa Ana. Um, this was the Treaty of Velasco. The, by the way, the Mexican government uh, ignored that treaty. They never recognized the independence of uh, Texas as a nation until Texas became part of the United States. At that point, Mexico knew it had lost Texas forever. But between 1836 uh, and 1845, when Texas becomes a state in the United States, there were uh, hopes in Mexico that it would that Mexico could recapture Texas. And in fact, a couple of uh, uh, Mexican armies march into Texas. Sorry, I'm looking for something. Uh, during this period, one even recaptures San Antonio for a couple of months in 1842. So um, Texas is becomes an independent nation, claims its independence. And then Sam Houston is elected president of Texas. You might see the sad end of Stephen F. Austin. He dies kind of alone um, very, very quickly after the uh, Texas Revolution. Um, he, he's pretty much forgotten. Uh, he, you might have wondered, where did Stephen F. Austin go? Well, he dies just a couple of months after the Texas Revolution. He never actually made that much money himself off the, uh, the colonization scheme that his father had started. Um, his sister actually was the one that made the money because she was able to farm cotton um, on Austin's land. Austin himself never really profited from um, the land colonization scheme. Um, so Sam Houston, and I don't want to go too much into detail, but I just want to point out, Torche talks about how Texas, Sam Houston, he Houston wants to be part of the United States from day one. Houston really has no desire uh, to uh, be an independent nation or that Texas be an independent nation. Uh, I'm going to talk about this. So note that uh, Jackson disappoints Houston, and he will only offer uh, Texas recognition, not annexation. So Jackson does do Houston a favor. He offers recognition that Texas is an independent nation. He, Jackson does that, by the way, the day before he leaves the office of presidency because he, he knew it'd be so hot to handle. But also Jackson makes Houston wait a year before he offers recognition. Um, he doesn't give it right away because he's worried about uh, the Mexican reaction. Also, the question of Texas becomes tied up in the question of slavery in the United States. But Torje talks about this. So here's the big point. Houston wants Texas to be part of the United States. Uh, most white Texans, that's what they want as well. But the United States will not accept Texas as a state anyway for 10 years. Um, so note that, that in some ways the Republic of Texas is an accident. It's not what Houston wanted. It's not what most Texans wanted. But the U.S. was not willing to annex Texas just yet. Um, on the diplomatic scene, Texas becomes uh, uh, an independent slaveholder republic right at the moment when abolition was gaining uh, a lot of weight, uh, a lot of currency, a lot of momentum. Almost the exact moment that Texas becomes an independent slaveholding nation based on, uh, uh, based on slavery, right? An independent republic based on slavery. Um, England has decided to free all the slaves in its Caribbean colonies, places like Jamaica. So England, the most powerful nation, the wealthiest nation on earth in the 1830s, decides to attack slavery. Uh, it, it, it attacks it by um, ending slavery. 800,000 slaves in British colonies in the Caribbean are freed over time. And the other thing is the British Navy uh, sends uh, vessels off the coast of Africa to try to suppress the African slave trade. So Britain becomes pretty active uh, in, in the abolitionist movement, which is significant because it's the most powerful nation on earth. Torje talks about this. Here's the problem for Texas. Texas grows cotton. Who's the biggest consumer of cotton? Great Britain. 
they consume, I think, about 400,000 bales of cotton a year. So you'll see in Torje this dance as Texas is trying to get Great Britain to either recognize it, uh, to establish normal trade relations, and, and Great Britain is very reluctant to do so. So key point, there is trade between Great Britain and uh, Texas, uh, but the diplomatic road is very, very rocky. And Texas, the Republic of Texas, is pretty isolated globally. Yes, the United States recognizes it, but uh, Great Britain is very slow to recognize Texas because of slavery. Um, and so Texas is not only is it a nation that's under all kinds of attack, Indian, Mexican, uh, it's in debt, um, uh, but it's also an isolated nation. Uh, it becomes a slaveholding republic almost at, at the exact moment where abolition uh, is, is gaining a very powerful um, ally in Great Britain. So, so note that and note the dance between Texans and Great Britain. Um, and they're never really able to resolve this. Sure, Great Britain wants uh, Texas cotton, but it also wants things from Texas. Ultimately, Great Britain forces Texas to end the African slave trade. The slaves were still coming in from uh, directly from Africa via Cuba into Texas. So they go from Africa, the captives, from Africa to Havana, from Havana to um, Texas. Uh, Great Britain does force Texas to stop the African slave trade, but I'll talk about that more uh, in a bit. So Texas is an isolated nation diplomatically. Um, now, American slaveholders are pouring into Texas. Uh, by 1842, uh, the number of slaves in Texas has grown from uh, 5,000, the number in 1836, to uh, about 20,000. So four times uh, in five years. Also note that by 1860, there'll be 200, about 186,000 slaves in Texas. So think about that. In 1836, there are 5,000 slaves in Texas. And when I talk about slaves, remember I'm talking about men, women, and children living under horrendous conditions. Uh, family separation is rampant. Uh, this slavery is a system that's ruled by terror, by punishment. Um, there's massive sexual assault, rape against slave women. So I just can't say enough, you know, I talk about slavery and just kind of move on. I just want you to know that there's tremendous suffering, right? This goes along with this system that's very much tied to cotton. So by 1860, the eve of the Civil War, there are just under 200,000 slaves in Texas. And then, of course, by 1865, slavery uh, has ended in the United States uh, and, and in Texas as well. So note that the slaveholders from the U.S. are coming into Texas. But point, note towards this point that wealthy slaveholders uh, do not come into Texas by and large. Mostly it's uh, uh, slaveholders that own very few slaves. Because for wealthy slave owners, owners, Texas is still very risky. Um, whereas the smaller slaveholders, they figure the, the risk is worth it because the slave, the cotton growing land in Texas is so cheap. Um, note that the president after Lamar, uh, Houston is a guy named Maribu B. Lamar. He's very different from Houston. He wants Texas to be an empire. He would love Texas to extend all the way to California. He's very aggressive, as I'll talk about. He, he launches an invasion of New Mexico, which is a massive failure. Um, he spends a lot of money, and Texas is deeper in debt. And he's also very, very aggressive against Texas Indians. And as I'll talk about, it's Lamar that drives the Cherokee out of Texas. Not the Comanche, the Cherokee. It's easy to confuse the two. The Comanche are still much too powerful. They're not going to be driven into Oklahoma territory until the 1880s. The Comanche are much less powerful. They're in East Texas. And Lamar is the president that basically kicks them out of Texas. I'll talk about that in a, another podcast. Um, the other thing to remember about Texas slaves, which is really interesting, and this kind of humanizes them a little bit, Texas was the only place uh, uh, in the United States when Texas became part of the U.S. that slaves went into Mexico to be free. 
I know there was some controversy earlier in the class. My very sharp SI pointed out that the 1829 anti-slavery decree was rescinded. But long story short, by the time Texas is an independent nation, slavery is illegal in Mexico. So Texas slaves almost constantly ran away into Mexico. We don't know how many slaves did run away into Mexico. There are estimates that nearly 5,000 slaves ran away to Mexico. Um, unfortunately, I think that's a little bit high, uh, but it, it's possible. But certainly Texas slaveholders thought that slaves were heading to Mexico, and they also distrusted Tejanos because they thought Tejanos were sympathetic to slaves. So uh, Torje talks about uh, the, the capture of the slave by the name Rafael, who has joined up with a roving gan band of Mexicans and Indians to oppose Texas rule. He's, he's murdered, he's lynched by the Texans. But note that at the same time you're having the increase of growth of slavery into Texas because there's more, uh, uh, there's more slaveholders coming into Texas. Why? To grow cotton. Why? To become part of the global cotton economy. Uh, that's when slaves ran away, they, they ran away um, uh, into Mexico. So I just wanted to touch upon some of the uh, issues that you're going to find uh, in the next two chapters of the Torje book. And I'm going to post another podcast that talks about this uh, in a little bit more detail. So again, I hope uh, everybody's doing well in these very, very, very difficult times.